Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, so hello and uh, good evening uh, from Cambridge. And of course, good morning uh, to those of you who are, who are joining us from Singapore or other parts of Asia, including of course our speaker, uh, Fang Xiaoping. Uh, so welcome to the, uh, welcome back to the Fairbank Center's Modern China Lecture Series. My name is Arunab Ghosh. Uh, I teach modern Chinese history here in the history department at Harvard. Uh, I'm also the convener of this lecture series. Today is the, the third talk of the semester. We have two others planned uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, so before I introduce our speaker for today, uh, I want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about the upcoming talks. Uh, two weeks from now, on November 2nd, uh, Eugenia Lin will speak about her work on, or ongoing work, on uh, Xiang Mao Honey Soap and histories of global capitalism. And then on November 30th, a few weeks after that, Joan Judge uh, will speak on print, vernacular languages, and reading practices across the long republic. So please look out for uh, formal announcements of these talks, uh, uh, which will also include information on how to register. Uh, th these will all be on, on online uh, on Zoom. Today, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Professor uh, Fang Xiaoping. Professor Fang is a historian of modern China. Uh, he has two, I guess, broad interests or broad research areas that he works in. Uh, the first is the history of medicine, health, and disease in 20th century China. And the second is the socio-political history of Mao's China, so that is China after 1949. Uh, Xiaoping is currently an assistant professor of history in the School of Humanities at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, as of this year, he's also the deputy head of the Chinese program at NTU. Prior to joining NTU in 2013, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Technology, Sydney for four years. Uh, and prior to that, he received his doctorate from the National University of Singapore, where he specialized in both modern Chinese history and in the history of science, technology, and medicine in East Asia. Hopping has conducted long or spent, ha has had long research stints uh, at the Needham Research Institute in Cambridge, UK, uh, at the Asia Research Institute uh, at the National University of Singapore, and most recently in 2019, 2020, he was a fellow of the National Humanities Center here in the US. He's the author of two books. The first, which came out in 2012, is titled Barefoot Doctors and Western Medicine in China. It was published by the University of Rochester Press. And much more recently, actually earlier this year, uh, he published China and the Cholera Epidemic, Restructuring Society Under Mao, which was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press and I presume we'll hear much more about the book also uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, in addition to his, his monographs, uh, uh, Xiaoping is widely published in both English and Chinese language journals, uh, venues such as China Quarterly, Modern Asian Studies, uh, Modern China, Guoji Hua and Yan Jiu Shui Bao, uh, for which he also uh, co-edited a special issue, and of course, uh, many others. To me, what is extremely impressive also is that he is a translator who has translated both ways, from Chinese to English and English to Chinese uh, of a few major academic works. This I find uh, quite amazing and very impressive. Um, the title of his talk today uh, is Pandemics and Politics in Mao's China, the Rise of the Emergency Disciplinary State. So Xiaoping, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, um, but before I hand things off to you, uh, a, quick, uh, a quick word about format to, for our audience. Uh, so Xiaoping will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes. We will then follow that with a Q&A for about 30 minutes. Uh, so finishing by, uh, if you're on the East Coast, USA, 9.15, 9.20, or thereabouts, or 9.20 a.m. Um, Singapore time. If you have questions, please write them up uh, using the Q&A function. And you're welcome to, to populate the, uh, the, to start writing your questions during the talk itself. I will try and get to as many questions as possible. I'll try and uh, collate them as best as I can. Uh, Ideally, if you can, before typing your question, identify yourself, we would appreciate that. But this is being recorded. So if you prefer to stay anonymous, that is of course perfectly fine too. Okay, so with that uh, note about, uh, about format out of the way, Xiaoping, welcome again and over to you. Uh, many thanks for Professor Gorge's kind introduction. And I'm very grateful to Professor Gorge, uh, Mark Brady and James Stevens for arranging uh, this lecture for me. I'm very pleased and honored to give a talk at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. And thank you all for watching and listening to my talk in the evening, in the morning, or in the afternoon. Um, my recently uh, published book, uh, my recently published book, uh, analyzed the 
dynamics between disease and the social restructuring during the uh, global corona pandemic in China between the uh, great political forward and the cultural revolution. Uh, as we all know, uh, they were the most two most radical political events of the 1980s. Um, in 1961, the Elto epidemic broke out on Sulawesi Island, Indonesia, uh, becoming the seventh global cholera pandemic in recorded history. Uh, in China, Elto cholera first broke out in Guangdong province in June 1961. Uh, Indonesian Chinese had returned to China during the archipelago's pandemic, escaping the political, economic, and the racial tension between in Indonesian and the Chinese, and were immediately- uh, Xiaoping, can I, can I interrupt you for a second? Your, uh, the audio is not very clear uh, for some members. I wonder if you can speak closer to the microphone. It's not okay. coming across very clearly. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's a little better, I think. Let's try, let's try this now, yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a returning Indonesian Chinese were, yeah, immediately, okay, were uh, immediately suspected the cholera uh, carriers. Uh, the cholera, was controlled in Yangjiang County, Guangdong Province by September 1961. However, uh, the disease re-emerged in Guangdong Province in February 1962 and uh, quickly became a pandemic, one that mainly affected the southeastern coast of China, spreading, uh, spreading rapidly through the Zhejiang Province, the Fujian Province, uh, first the Zhejiang Province and then Fujian. Uh, Shanghai and Jiangsu from July 1962 to uh, 1965. Uh, the 1961 to 1965 uh, pandemic broke out and spread uh, throughout southeast the coast of China in a very specific social political context. In China, uh, it arrived in China at a delicate time when the devastation of the Great Famine of 1959 to 1961 was still lingering. In local politics, in local politics, the government committed to social restructuring in order to overcome the political crisis and then reconsolidate the legitimacy of its role. As a crucial steps to, uh, toward the risk, the government reformed and restrained the screen as schemes for controlling the population mobility and creating the organizational units, undertaking the social surveillance, conducting political indoctrination, and further implemented the economic strategies and the policies that it had initiated in early 1950s. At the same time, it consolidates a strict division of the Chinese society into a rural and urban areas. So this social restructuring in early 1960s brought about a transition from a chaotic population movement that was characteristic of the great people forward years to the orderly mobility in the more sedentary post-farming society. The state dominance of world life, production, and consumption brought about the social restructuring of the 1960s, continued largely intact throughout uh, North China. As this social political change was also intensified and complicated by geopolitical roles of China with the international community at the peak of the Cold War. In this international context, China experienced reshuffling of its geopolitical and ideological interests clashed with allies at neighboring countries and areas, in, particularly in Southeast and East Asia. These uh, included Indonesian-Chinese nationality issues, 
and then Chiang Kai shares the military preparations for a quotation mark uh, reclaiming the mainland. This external environment both challenges and reinforced the social restructuring process. So my book uh, investigates the, the dynamics between the disease and the social restructuring in the significant transitional years of Mao's China. It seeks to examine the questions in three parts or three aspects, uh, including the disease and the mobility, social divisions and borders, the data and data and the social structure. Uh, my book chose to center my study on Wenzhou prefecture because the horror instance was the highest in Southeast coast of China, according to the uh, statistic that data available. Uh, we understand it is quite difficult to get the accurate statistic data. And uh, Zhejiang uh, was also among the pro provinces with the highest uh, instance of the disease out of uh, those affected by the cholera in the southeast of China at the time in the 1960s. Uh, furthermore, uh, Wenzhou's large coastal regions and extensive river and the belt access have endowed it with the specific uh, geopolitical significance uh, since the 1950s, uh, since early 1950s. The nationalist government uh, based in Taiwan uh, regarded it as a bridge across the which it would, uh, uh, quotation mark, uh, reclaim the mainland. Why the communist government identified Wenzhou as the frontier uh, of anti-imperialism and anti chiang kai groups. So the military confrontations between the nationalists and the communists reached uh, its peak in June 1962, June 1962, precisely when the Cora pandemic was ravaging Wenzhou prefecture, the Yang province. So Wenzhou was a coastal front society within a wider uh, Cold War uh, in Asia. So further complicates uh, this, uh, Wenzhou was also a major point of origin for overseas Chinese from Zhejiang province, uh, immigrants from, uh, from Hong Kong, Macau, and Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, visited uh, Wenzhou intermittently throughout the 1950s and the 1960s. So now let's look at the emergency uh, response scheme. So right after the outbreak of the cholera pandemic, the Chinese government launched a large scale but clandestine, clandestine uh, emergency response scheme, which included interventionist measures such as quarantine, isolation, and mass inoculation. And, and the epidemic surveillance, the last the information control, uh, when China was an isolated nation in a globalized health community during the Cold War. Uh, it should be uh, noted that elder cholera often appeared in a mild clinical form and the results the many symptomless, symptomless carriers moving around while unaware that there was spring disease. But indeed, the majority of the individuals infected with the cholera either had no symptoms or just showed mild, mild diarrhea. For classical, it is, it is different from the classical cholera. cholera. For class, uh, classical cholera, the ratio of the severe cases that require the hospitalization to either uh, mild or asymptomatic infections, one to five to one to 10. But for elder cholera, as this figure reaches, reaches one to 20, 25 to one to 100. So it's much, uh, much higher. Uh, furthermore, uh, both uh, quarantine and the inoculation were not advocated by international community, the medical and health communities such as the WHO in 1960s uh, and the 1970s. So by the 1970s, the WHO had explicitly 
I pointed out inoculation was usually of no health for cholera control. Uh, uh, these are the similar cases uh, were plague and uh, tuberculosis. Well, anyway, we are talking about the, the history of the cholera and the plague and the, and the tuberculosis. It is different from Paris and uh, COVID-19. Um, so now let's look at the quarantine and, and isolation. So after a week, uh, a week after the first cholera case uh, was confirmed in Rian County in July uh, 1962, the Zhejiang Provincial Health Department issued its first circular on the cholera uh, quarantine. The first, uh, the provincial, the provincial government divided the Zhejiang Province uh, into three zones and that assigned the different control and prevention duties. In this way, the Zhejiang provincial government partitioned the whole province into a series of concentric circles that are centered on the cholera affected Wenzhou prefecture, in just three, uh, three, pro, uh, three counties. Uh, within uh, these uh, geographical zones, the provincial government set up uh, major observation stations along the railway lines in, within the Zhejiang province. Uh, in the meantime, a series of high mountains that was located uh, between the Wenzhou and uh, this uh, quarantine belt formed uh, the, a geographical barrier. In addition, because the cholera mainly spread by the fishermen, uh, a lot of fishermen come from, come from uh, Guangdong and the Fujian. Um, uh, so the Zhejiang province, Zhejiang, uh, Zhejiang provincial government set up a temporary joint quarantine stations the three major archipelagos in, uh, in Zhejiang. So in combination with the railway and the geographical belts on them, they formed the first uh, quarantine rings around the Wenzhou. Within this uh, quarantine ring, the provincial government formed the second and the third rings of the quarantine control, uh, control mechanism along the major highways and the maritime, maritime roads that connect the Wenzhou to other areas of the province. So within these three quarantine rings, the county and the city governments further divided the quarantine zones from the county level down to that of the districts and the communes on the basis of the existing administrative structure. The infected and neighboring areas were further classified into blockade areas, semi-blockaded areas, and controlled areas. So this is the practice of the quarantine and the isolation. In my book, I investigate the rise of the multiple borders, including the natural borders, the administrative border, the militia uh, borders, meaning the quarantine uh, borders, and the day's significance in the reciprocal interaction between the interventionist prevention measures and the social restructuring during the pandemic in 1965. My study shows so how the social critical restructuring uh, prior to the pandemic led to the rise of invisible administrative borders based on the visible and the nature borders through the compositional homogeneity, uh, political surveillance, and economic egalitarianism. The quarantine scheme further reduced the administrative borders through the partition and the encirclement, while the quarantine station interwove this uh, nature uh, administrative, military, and academic related border and created a tight surveillance network. Uh, my study also shows the problems around the quarantines of suspected cases and isolation of infected patients during the cholera prevention work. The principle of the, the on-the-spot uh, isolation, economic concerns, and the fear of contagion shape the distribution features of the isolated patients, which reflected and strengthened the rural urban hierarchy by containing further containing the population and mobility. However, uh, the, first, uh, the isolation process itself 
itself become a potential source of contagion due to the poor medical facilities and the unfair resource distribution. Uh, similarly, uh, quarantine schemes further contain the mobility of the sedentary populations, regulate the movement of mobile populations, uh, mo monitor the activities of populations in the very dangerous. However, the quarantine was being effective, not so effective, not so effective at identifying the atyp atypical patients and the suspected, suspected carriers given the feature of the coral uh, transmission and mentioned just now. Uh, quarantine and uh, isolation does greatly strengthen the contour of the newly restructured society. And I argue that interventionist scheme to control the pandemic not only harness the opportunities provided by the broad social restructuring initiative, but also directly contributed to these efforts and significantly facilitated the rise of the emergency epidemic state. Uh, if mass inoculation was another interventionist uh, measures, traditional and interventionist measures adopted during the pandemic. In the early 1960s, Chinese medical experts uh, believed that only when 80% of the total population were inoculated could a community uh, achieve adequate immunity against the Torah. Accordingly, uh, on August 3, 1962, directives from the Zhejiang Provincial um, Party Committee and the People's Commission ruled that the entire population in each uh, in each county of Wenzhou Prefecture had to be inoculated against the before uh, August 15, only uh, less than 12 days. So emergency inoculation in, uh, initiative means a total inoculation campaign in which local governments had to inoculate a total of 2.34 million people within 12 days. So this emergency posed a serious challenge for both uh, for local governments in view of very limited time frame, the extent of the duty and the serious of shortage of medical personnel. At the heart of the problem, there is a requirement to secure the accurate population information and the coordinate the professional medical system and the local administrative system, because a lot of the uh, medical professions uh, come from the other areas. Uh, my study explores how the restructure of the rural society, uh, rural social system facilitated the entry of the total emergency uh, inoculation schemes into rural uh, villages by making the local uh, agents and house information readily available. It also considers how the inoculation campaign had adjusted, improved, and then eventually strengthened the, the newly downsized and the restructured the people's economic system. So my, my study documents how the downsizing of population production brigades the designation of the duties to local countries, the compilation of the household registers, and the implementation of the new payment schemes, whom we call the Hongfen, the Hongfen, greatly facilitated the state control over rural areas and theoretically provided the efficient local countries and accurate demographic information for inoculation programs. Uh, however, the emergency inoculation schemes in the summer of 1962 suffered due to the poor coordination of the local countries and the chaotic information on inoculation subjects. The strengthening of, strengthening of the roles of the former and the creation of reliable inoculation registers based on the brigade household register and the team accounting uh, team accounting books facilitated a concerted total inoculation campaign in 
and afterward. Uh, this is the uh, progress on uh, progress on the coral inoculation in uh, Rian County uh, from 1962 to 1964. As we can see, um, in 1962, it took around uh, 100 days to complete the inoculation campaign. So by 1965, uh, it only took seven to 10 days to complete uh, inoculation within Coho County. So it's much, much quicker. Uh, it should be uh, noted that the mass inoculation campaign were I mean, the core campaign, uh, inoculation campaign were in, implemented uh, during the next two decades according to the schedules and the reason established uh, in 1963. Uh, this preventive inoculation uh, against the cholera uh, were phased out in China in late 1970s. Uh, in my book, I argue uh, the inoculation uh, registers and the uh, certificates generated by these campaigns were very significant for the concurrent restructuring of the people's communal system as we have as the household and demographic data were more accurate than reliable through the repeated verifications. And this process demonstrated the dynamic interactions between the household accounting and the inoculation register uh, during a period of significant social restructuring. And this was uh, implemented through the demographic data gallery that was initially designed to verify the data in order to deliver the health outcomes by the distribution of the inoculation certificate. Uh, this bureaucratic process further contributes to the, the formation of the uh, uh, sedentary society and creates a new set of biopolitical data that would in, uh, encompass the whole society. Uh, so functionalized as a population control and the surveillance scheme, all these inoculation campaigns strengthen the emergency disciplinary state in the changing social political context. Uh, epidemic surveillance and the statistics uh, during the pandemic had been a solid issue uh, in the epidemic prevention system of 20th century China. The difficulties of epidemic reporting uh, caused by the problems of coordination and the capacity of the administrative and the medical system still haunted the new governments after 1949. Uh, though the Chinese government quickly established a complete administrative system right after its revolutionary victory, uh, the medical system, uh, including the epidemic prevention scheme, did not emerge uh, nationwide until the mid 1950s, uh, just six to seven years before the outbreak of the global cholera pandemic in 1952. Uh, this not only posed the great challenges to the emergency response to the pandemic, but also provided a significant opportunity for improving the epidemic prevention scheme uh, through the restructuring and integration of the two systems. Uh, the medical and administrative system in, 19, in early 1960s. So my study explores the rise of the disease surveillance uh, actions and the politics of the disease statistic collection and how this contributes to the, the social restructuring uh, through the three concurrent process. The first is the institutionalization of the medical system. The second, the medical regionalization of the administrative system, and third, epidemiological categorization of the discrete populations. So I argue uh, the establishment of, of the outpatient departments for testing uh, diseases, the submission of the stool sample for testing, and the control of the medical practitioner were three uh, crucial steps in the medical institutional process in 1963 and after. The cellularized epidemic reporting based on the vertical downward scheme and horizontal regionalization 
for both the professional and the voluntary mass academic reporting networks effectively regionalize the uh, grassroots administrative system within the social restructuring that was taking place at the time. Uh, my study also argues that the follow up to test for cholera patients, the classic classification of patients, the suspected carriers, vulnerable uh, groups, and healthy populations, and the creation of patients' eye types uh, functioned as epidemiological uh, categorization for different populations. Uh, this process was integrated with the household registers, along with the inoculation registers, and uh, contributed to the rise of a new kind of uh, statistic uh, uh, politics, which helped shape the concurrent social structure. Uh, in all, as the new and the integral biological control tool, the epidemic statistical schemes quickly developed as a crucial part of uh, an emergency uh, disciplinary state. Uh, the, in, the issue, the final, final one, the issue of the information control involves both the politics of the pandemic information and the historical origins of the tradition of the secrecy around the epidemic statistics in contemporary China, in North China. The uh, cholera pandemic information was highly uh, criticized in domestic and international political context of the 1960s and it contributed to concurrent ground level social restructuring process. Entrenched the supernatural inter interpretations of the etiologies and the religious, religious practice and the social memory of the cholera pandemic posed the serious concerns for the uh, communist government in terms of maintaining a social orders and political legitimacy. The cholera functioned as a political metaphor and an effective control of it justified the uh, government's role. As part of the response efforts, cholera was defined as a national secret that, like other epidemics, and pandemic information, and it was coded as a level two disease in Chinese called uh, uh, Information on it was uh, not only strictly controlled, but also held with the considerable critical significance inside the government system. That the top down dis uh, dissemination and surveillance of pandemic information become a form of critical discipline of the targets. The silence, silencing of the public media and the strict control of the information about the cholera pandemic to the masses functioned as a political indoctrination. Uh, in the international area, the Chinese government created an information asymmetry between asymmetry between the instilled and the international health community and the further endowed information about the cholera pandemic with the political functions of advancing the ideological work. Information control uh, that uh, become the key features of, uh, uh, of an emergency response team for epidemics and the pandemics, in addition to the traditional interventionist methods such as the quarantine, isolation, and inoculation in North China. Uh, more significantly, the political discipline, indoctrination, and the ideology like ideology imposed by the cholera pandemic information control scheme had a comprehensive impact on the different uh, administrative uh, systems and social groups such as party and government system, the propaganda system, local party, medical professionals, and the ordinary people. Uh, during this control process, criticism uh, Self criticism, punishment, control, and guided narratives were widely applied. As a cohesive uh, and a disciplinary scheme, information control became an uh, adjunct a political event accompanying the cholera pandemic, one which significantly contributed to the concurrent social restructuring and the more broadly uh, the rise of emergency disciplinary state in North China. Also, conclusion, uh, disease and its uh, control were not only affected by social restructuring that began in 
1950s and its changed since 1961, but also in, in integral components of this quarantine, isolation, mass inoculation, epidemic surveillance, information control, functionalized social control, and a political discipline, and therefore significantly contributed to the rise of emergency experimental state. In the all, the emergency experimental state was composed of the top-down leadership, the vertical, vertical bureaucratic system, and the horizontal grassroots social organization, including the people's common system and the work units based on the household registration system. Through the centralization of the political power, the dominance of the administrative system, and the civilization of the local society, this regime was an integral and active government entity. The government, the party and the social government, maneuvered nationwide med uh, medical resources and the personnel in response to pandemic. And medical, medical and administrative system jointly participate in epidemic prevention campaigns. Restructure the rural and urban society facilitated the implementation of the traditional interventionist measures. Uh, in all, this process depended on the richness of the medical resources, the integration of the two medical and administrative systems, and the cooperation of the local society. Uh, it was not a, a straightforward process. However, once it was uh, improved, uh, the public health response team to change the emergency state uh, demonstrated its efficiency, aggressivity, and the resilience. And the rise of the emergency experience phase during the public health emergency response of uh, 1961 to 1965 was of great significance uh, in a broad historical context. It's uh, exerted a far reaching impact on the social political system and the emergency response uh, since Mao's China. So, uh, thank you all. Great, thank, thank you so much. Uh, that, was, that was really fascinating and a really nice comprehensive sort of uh, overview of, of your book and your, your main arguments. Uh, so uh, the floor is open for questions. If people want to type them up in the Q&A function, uh, please do so, and I will try and um, get to them um, in, in as, uh, uh, I guess, logical a way as possible. Uh, but as we, as we perhaps collect questions, maybe I can ask you uh, something to begin the conversation, Xiaoping. I was struck listening, listening to you, and, and as I began reading the book, uh, sort of about the parallels that, parallels are perhaps also differences that exist uh, with Miriam Gross's book. You know who wrote about uh, uh, farewell to the god of plague, which is about schistosomiasis. Uh, yes. and my, my my sense is it's on a slightly later period. But one of the things that she uh, she talks a lot about. So one thing she talks about, of course, is is the role of the youth, the send down youth, and so on, which I think is of course not directly applicable to uh, to the early sixties. Uh, but the other thing that I think is an enduring sort of question that she uh, offers insights on is this sort of divide between uh, sort of. Uh, Hong, Hong and Juan, right? The red expert kind oh, of distinction. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, do you see sort of, uh, uh, what is what is your, your sense of how this this sort of divide plays out in Zhejiang uh, and, and how does it sort of relate to perhaps what, what Miriam argues? Oh, yes, uh, very good questions. Uh, Hong and Juan is a very, uh, very important uh, issue and uh, or topic. Um, you know, um, Dave Lampton, David Lampton uh, wrote a book about the political medicine uh, from 1949 to, 19, uh, to 1977. He analyzed the uh, analyzed the relationship between the between the uh, top uh, party leadership and uh, the Ministry of Health. Ministry of Health. So uh, uh, on this question, for, I mean, the, on the web, uh, on and the trend, uh, in 1961, uh, from 1961 to 1965, uh, the relationship between the medical professionals and uh, the party were much, uh, was much better than at the period. So I mean, uh, the medical professionals participate in the uh, emergency response schemes actively, and the governments uh, couldn't listen to their opinions. 
So that, that's my that's my answer. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so that, that's actually quite interesting and different, yeah. But later, um, the situation changed right, after right, 1965 right. changed. Mm -hmm. But during this period, they, they participate the, the event very, very actively. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Yeah, we have a question that's come in from uh, Lini Tan, who's uh, right now a visiting fellow at the Fairbank Center. Uh, she asks, uh, she says, uh, thank you, Professor Fang, for the presentation and the book that I found very rich and interesting. I wonder if you could share with us if the influenza pandemic in 1957 influenced the Chinese government's reactions to the cholera pandemic. So, sorry, the pandemic. The, 19, the 1957 influenza pandemic. 90 of, oh, 1957's influenza. Yeah, if it had any uh, influence honest, on the Chinese government. Yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, I, I have heard of the, 90, uh, the influenza in 1957, but I have not done much uh, research on this topic. But in 1907, uh, to my knowledge, uh, during the Great Leap Forward, during the Great Leap Forward, um, epidemic meningitis was very serious. You know the epidemic meningitis. Epidemic meningitis mm -hmm. was, uh, broke out in uh, during the Great Leap Forward, and during the early stage of the, the Cultural Revolution, it broke out again. So I pay a lot of attention to epidemic meningitis, but I did not, to be honest, I did not pay attention, much attention to the influenza. In 1957. I think it's an important topic. Great, yeah, thank you. I mean, in some ways, before I go to the next question, maybe I can ask something else that I think builds off of um, uh, what, what uh, uh, Lini Tang just, uh, I think, asked, which is, if you were to sort of do a slightly longer durée, try to sort of situate the story you're telling of the 1960s in a longer durée that goes from, I guess, you know, the early work we have on, um, the Manchurian plague, for instance, oh. and the early measures that that you know that were devised then that became globally influential in some ways, and then you know sort of situate your work, and then of course more recently with SARS and now with COVID nineteen. Uh, if you were to sort of say one say one interesting continuity or moment of this juncture that uh, the the cholera case presents, what might come to mind? I'm just sort of trying to think of the long durée. You know, if if this is mm. a, an overall process of a straight strength, strengthening, straight, you know, sort of the emergency disciplinary state that you say, or do you, do you see this as a much more uneven process? Um, uh, uh, regarding the continuity, I think um, the relationship between the, between the medical systems and administrative, administrative system is very significant during the, the changing social political context. I mean, uh, the the Manchurian, uh, Manchurian play, the Cora pandemic, the SARS, and even the, the current the COVID-19, the broke out spread in the different social uh, social restructuring, but all of them involve the key uh, the key issue that is the relationship between the uh, between the administrative and the medical system. The second uh, issue I think uh, should be uh, vaccines. Vaccine, but it is not so important. As I mentioned in my presentation and in my, in my book, uh, international health uh, community did not advocate the use of the use of the vaccines because the cholera is a classic disease. It is not so difficult to control, prevent, and, and cure. Just the, uh, the government just needs needs to improve the basic uh, sanitary the infra infrastructure. Provide the clean water and the vaccine. Um, I think the most important thing relationship between the medical and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, administrative system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's great. In some ways, I think the two questions that have come up uh, have come up that are related to each other. Uh, maybe ask you to elaborate on on precisely this nexus in terms of what maybe the state, the current state, has learned from the 60s. So I'll just read out the two questions. Um, and then, then you can sort of see if you can elaborate on, on, on uh, any of these aspects. So this is from an anonymous uh, attendee who says, thanks for the talk, Professor Fang. I wonder how would you compare the public health response scheme in the socialist era and the one PRC has today? So, you know, along the lines of what you're saying, especially their difference in addition to the recent adoption of digital tracking techniques. And what are some of the lessons of the post-socialist 
of post-socialist China want to learn from socialist China in the latter's response to the pandemic? So what are the lessons that could be learned from the 60s or today? Uh, and similarly, there's a question from, uh, from Li Ping Yang who says, uh, thank you, Professor Fang, for your great presentation about your research. Uh, what do you think of the implications of the experience accumulated by the Chinese government in handling the cholera epidemic in the 60s to its management of the ongoing COVID pandemic? So again, asking you specifically what we see today that might have roots in, in, the, you know, in, in the kinds of processes you uncovered in the 60s. Uh, okay. Okay. Um... I, I was trained in, uh, in Chinese history. I was not in I was not trained in uh, epidemiology and public health, so I'm not expert to make comments on about the current uh, current uh, measures and achievements uh, in, in China today. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the book uh, very important uh, is the is the. Uh, it's uh, very important is the emergency response uh, response schemes in established uh, in 1960s uh, was entrenched in the uh, emergency disciplinary state and these are uh, the, the characteristics of this uh, emergency disciplinary state that demonstrate that its um, uh, aggressiveness and the resilience I mean the resilience so uh, as we have uh, as we have seen, after the outbreak of the SARS in 2002 to 2003, uh, the government uh, still resorted to adopt the, the traditional interventions, the interventions and measures. And nowadays, uh, these uh, traditional interventions and measures will uh, still be are still being strictly implement, implemented nationwide in China. So that's my uh, that's my comment. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I'm not surprised that there are so many questions asking you to, you know, so what is the, what is the sort of the connection to, to today, given that, you know, we are in, a, in the midst of a, a global pandemic. But uh, perhaps uh, uh, we could go back to another question that I found, of course, given my own work, very interesting, which is, you know, your talk, the, the, the research that you've done with regard to statistical practices, and then the way they, mm -hmm. they, they sort of emerged. Um, I, I'm wondering sort of what, so the, the the focus seems to be uh, at a provincial level and then at a county level in terms of the research you've done. And I was wondering how, you know, to what extent you see this fitting into the medical statistical data that is being produced. Is that then fitting into sort of some kind of national, like a national system? Or are these much more sort of local initiatives, even though, you know, you, you talk about a top-down system, but are these a lot more local in terms of the initiatives, in terms of the standards and so on? So partly what I'm asking is within the statistical, the emergence of this kind of statistical data, what is the relationship uh, across the different levels of government from the center to the province to then the county and, and even perhaps the village in some ways? Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for your question. I have learned a lot from your book, so thank you. No, um, thank you very much. Yeah, well, I think it is, uh, well uh, considered top down nationwide initiative it is definitely not not the local initiative it is well connected well uh, considered uh, top down and nationwide i mean the uh, county governments provincial governments follow the instructions of the central government and they com they collected compiled the data and reported it to the Upper uh, governments, the levels, the step by step. So it is the top down, uh, top down, and the bottom up uh, the process. So, so uh, what it, it so is also national, right? Sorry, nationwide. Sorry, nationwide. Yeah, it, it is also nationwide uh, uh, program, and it, it is uh, it is improved the step by step uh, in 1950s, 60s, and 70s. But the significance of this uh, statistic. Uh, uh, the politics uh, in during the coral pandemic was uh, allied in its uh, institutional beauty. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, this uh, emergency response scheme established uh, preliminary, uh, preliminary uh, the systems. I see. So, okay. a, a quick follow up then. Uh, just uh, so, how how do you sort of assess uh, or what? what not, not you, but how did? Um, 
how did they sort of deal with these questions of you know these concerns over accuracy is especially as the data is traveling up uh, up to you know the provincial level and then all the way to beijing uh, how what was sort of the understanding of is this data accurate you know i'm 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 thinking of this in the larger context of you know the problems we know with the great leap forward and the you know the way in which data itself became such a political political mm. subject uh, and then this problem of accuracy uh, somehow plagues contemporary the contemporary perceptions of the mm. Chinese state also whether it's GDP data whether it's now mm. you know in the early yes. days of COVID nineteen COVID nineteen data and so on so what was the at that time what was sort of the approach or understanding of the quality of the data that's being that's being produced? Oh, well, I think it's a very good question. Um, as we all understand, the accuracy of in statistical data uh, in most China. Has been a has it been a problem as an issue? Uh, we uh, as I, I did, we did not we should not expect we can get the very accurate uh, static data concerning such as the, the disease or other other, other social political uh, e events. Um, for me, I think it is a, a qualitative research, not a quantitative mm -hmm. research. Um, so I just I, I can I just try my best try my best to to get the statistic statistic data uh, I can get I can I can access mm -hmm. and this data I am sure can show the general uh, statistic uh, general character characteristics and uh, the general change of the whole situation. So for right. example, we, it, it it is very hard. It is almost impossible to get the all the Accurate information concerning the concerning the corona pandemic and mm -hmm. other epidemics and the disease, but uh, we can present uh, uh, general pictures of the uh, characteristics and the trends of the the development right. outbreak or the spread and transmission of the of these epidemics and the pandemics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. General right. right. I was asking. Um, the, what I was asking was a slightly slightly different in the sense that. In the, do you see this concern amongst the actors that you're looking at? So the, whether at the at the village and county level or at the provincial level, you know, do they uh, express any concerns about the data that's being generated? You know, did you did you sort of see that in the archival record or in 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 you know printed reports and things like that, or or is that never really does that never become a topic? Uh, oh, sorry, you mean accuracy? Uh, in the local yeah, like, yeah, I'm so, so, exactly. The so are they themselves talking about it at any level or not? Uh, uh, I just uh, read one. I read one archive document uh, concerning about the local government concern about the accuracy of the epidemic, uh, uh, corona epidemic. But uh, and I, I mentioned I mentioned in my in my book that local government did not some some local governments did not. Uh, Want to report the accurate the information because it involved it involved the, the local economies mm -hmm. and, the, and and the images and the political performance of the local countries. So that's the they, they concern. But it happened in just a few a few uh, towns, a few uh, people's communes. Right. It's not the, the widely happened uh, situation uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thanks. Uh, we have another question from uh, an anonymous attendee who says, thank you for your fascinating talk. Uh, Ruth Rogaski's hygienic modernity traced the marriage of public health and modernity through national crises amid European and Japanese imperialism. And Mary Brazelton also noted the role of mass vaccination in the state developing new forms of control and social engagement. So they're asking, I wonder how the particularities of your emergency framework contribute to the existing historiography. So what are the continuities and changes across the cholera crisis divide? Thank you. Mm. Uh, I see my contribution. Okay. Uh, right, in terms I of, this sort of in this genealogy, so if you take Ruth Rogaski's work, you know, which addresses a particular moment in Tianjin with imperialism, and, and, mm. and sort of public health and the, the desire to be modern as, as one example. Then uh, Mary Brazelton is looking at sort of Southwest China wartime, very, again, mm. very different context, but uh, sort of uh, uh, social engagement and, and, and sort of uh, state control expanding through vaccination. So I guess if there is a genealogy, I guess they're asking, uh, where would you fit your emergency framework? Uh, 
Uh, I think uh, the uh, Professor Luca, uh, Luz Lukaski and uh, Professor Mary presenting uh, work uh, concerning changing and, uh, and, and the Yunnan give a lot of give me a great deal of inspirations. So it alerts uh, they they works alert, alert me to pay attention to uh, the relationship between the uh, medical systems and the administrative systems. That's the great, uh, greatest uh, inspirations I got from the, the, the work and the theoretical uh, concepts like the um, uh, hygienic modernity mm -hmm. and uh, mass inoculation. Mm -hmm. And so, and would you say something similar then for uh, for Mary Mary Brazelton's work? You know, the uh, uh, work on wartime wartime vaccination in in, in southwest. Oh yeah, China. wartime war. Uh, Comparing with a uh, wartime uh, vaccination in Yunnan and other parts of the uh, southwestern China, uh, the difference the difference is uh, there was uh, not um, uh, there was a uh, not uh, administrative system during the during the mm -hmm. wartime China, or uh, in other words, the, during the wartime China, the local administrative systems could not effectively participate in the uh, inoculation the campaigns mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but after after 19, 1960s the inoculation campaigns was promoted and implemented nationwide the following the establishment of the uh, top-down administrative system I think that's the uh, that might be the main difference between the wartime China and the mouse China mm -hmm. Right, so it, it sort of in some ways presents different different ways of, for us to think about state capacity. Also, that they're both both kinds of state capacity, but very different because of the the mechanisms through which that state capacity is exercised or realized. I guess mm -hmm. is one way to think about it. Yeah. Okay, we're well. We're approaching the end of our time here. Uh, I would invite the people uh, who are in the audience still, if they have a, a, maybe a final question to ask, we can we can take a final question or two, um, and. Uh, and see if, uh, if anyone else wants to ask a question. If not, then I will ask. Oh, well, here's, here's uh, Lini Tang has another question. Otherwise, I was going to ask a final question, but maybe we'll take hers as a, as a, as a final question. Thank you, uh, Tang. She asks, in your book, uh, you talked about control, but also about the resistance and out of control in some situ situations, such as mass vaccination, so resistance to mass vaccination. Would you tell us a bit more about the resistance against this emergency disciplinary state? To what extent this disciplinary state was efficient on the ground? Uh, yes, uh, to some extent, to some extent, resistance, uh, resist, resistance to uh, the mass uh, inoculation campaign did happen uh, during the pandemic. But uh, it is not a wide, uh, wide phenomenon. It happened, but it, it was so wide. It was not a wide phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks. So maybe I'll, 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 I'll ask the last question uh, and then we can, we can wrap up. But uh, so this, this it, it sort of builds on, on, on Itang's question right now about the emergence, emergency disciplinary state as a concept. I was wondering, I'm trying to think of how, how portable something like this is to other contexts and other parts of the world in some ways. And I wonder if you've thought about this as a, so is this a useful way to think about, you know, maybe other, uh, you know, so is this giving us something as a, as a concept that we can use in, in, in broader, uh, bro broader contexts and not just make it something very specific to China? I wonder what your reflections are. Do you see it as being, being something that can travel uh, and address other, other contexts? Uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, thought about the, my the contribution, uh, the uh, inspirations of my uh, theoretical concept. And I would be I would be very happy to see if our uh, colleagues in the field uh, studying the other social contexts would be interested in my uh, my in my concept. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, because it's it, it's it's interesting to think about it just in terms of at these moments of crisis, whether states can make arguments for essentially exceptional circumstances um, that allow for, you know, to, you know, to use, to essentially allow for states of exception, different kinds of states mm -hmm. of exception that then, 
that then get somewhat normalized even after the crisis is over. And to some extent, if this fits within those kinds of patterns that you see where you know, it's an expansion of state control and state capacity building off of moments of crisis and whether then this would be, it can fit into those larger debates also or not, which would be, I think, very interesting to think about. Uh, anyway, uh, I, sorry, I don't know if you're gonna say something, so. Oh, yeah, yes, I think definitely. Uh, it, it, um, particularly, uh, I think this uh, concept that will help us uh, understand the impact of the current pandemic on our daily life. Uh, as I mentioned in, in the conclusion of my book, I also just briefly, very briefly discussed about the, the health code. So every day we use the health, uh, health code to enter uh, the office and into mm -hmm. the shopping malls. And then all our all our information, all the information uh, is being recorded and then monitored. So that is that is very significant. Right. So that would be a, that would be an interesting example to sort of study and situate within this uh, through this through this paradigm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're at time. So thank you so much. Uh, this was this was both a fantastic talk and a great discussion. And thank you to our audience members uh, for joining us and for your questions. Uh, and you have a, a, a comment here also from, from Bin Liang who says who thanks you. So uh, please uh, join me in, in, in thanking uh, Professor uh, Fang Xiaoping and please do join us uh, in a few weeks time for our next talk on November 2nd, I think with Eugenia Lee from Columbia University. So thank you again. Yes, thank you all, it's my great pleasure.